Come on. Thank you. All right. But I, I don't have a choke, though. <laughs> I told you you'd get a standing ovation, right? Even though I didn't tell a joke yet. And not even a straight joke. Uh, Plywood, please welcome Horst Schulze. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're going to get right into it. He has so much content that we can't fit, enough, we can't fit it all in in the amount of time we have together with him. But uh, he was the founder of Ritz Carlton and um, recently is the CEO of the Capella Hotel Group. And, um, and also is on the board of five different other companies that he's involved in right now. Yeah. And um, so we're going to get right into some questions and get you talking. Is that all right? All right. All right. Um, so you have an incredible legacy through Ritz-Carlton. And I, I wonder, when you think back in your story about some of the best decisions you made, what were some of those great decisions? Hire, hiring good people. Hmm. Number one, no, the, the, the first thing is, of course, having the right vision as to where to take the company and then aligning people behind that vision. Uh, everything is driven as a vision. We first have to have an idea. I mean, without the idea, nothing will happen. So even so, it, it always may be the most important thing that you do for an organization to see, to have the idea as to where you want to take that company and then align the organization behind it and march toward that point that you have vision. If without it, there is nothing. And so, of course, on the way to that vision, to that destination, if you will, many ideas, many good decisions have to be made, including aligning the right people behind the, the objective. And, and uh, there are many, many other decisions from day to day that you have to make. But, the driver should be, and that's, that's, that's the key element, the driver has to be the vision. Without, without it, you're just functioning. Mm -hmm. And as a human being, you should be driven by purpose and thought and not just by function. So then you talked about hiring people. I know you have a ton to say about that. Start, start sharing a yeah. little bit about that. Oh, okay, you must have heard some of my speeches. All right. Yeah, well, it's not hiring people. You have to select people. I mean, hiring people is a 50-50% chance always. You select people and to, that can join you, that, and that have the vision, that can have the vision that you have and align them to it. That, that's one of the problems with most organizations. They hire people to fulfill a certain function. I, in my business, I hire people to make beds and, and, and to check people in, to cook food, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In a way, that's immoral, in my opinion. You hire people to join your dream. Again, driven by the vision, that's the dream. And you hire people to join you, to be part of a purpose rather than, again, we hire them for a certain function. The chair on which you're sitting is fulfilling a function, but we're hiring human beings. And we should hire them to join a purpose, a dream, a vision. And people need purpose. And we hire them to, to fulfill the function, then we expect them suddenly to stand behind your vision. It's ridiculous. In fact, I think it's immoral. And you talk about the, 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 these people that you hire are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, you shouldn't have brought it up because that will take all our time. Keep coming. You know, Come on. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, it, it has, in my industry, that has become a famous expression. It goes back to, to I, I started as a busboy, uh, living away from home, about 100 miles away from home in a hotel, and a busboy, and I had a maitre d' that was an exceptional gentleman that impacted my life dramatically. Uh, going, I was told, we are servants and the guests are important, we are not, in fact, my parents told me we could never go to a hotel like that. This is for important people and you work there. Well, after working for a while, I was asked, uh, in a hotel, going once a week to hotel school, I was asked to write an essay as to what I now think about my business. And I thought about it and, and I had to, I wrote about the matter D because that night, I saw him approaching a table, and I could tell the table that he, the people on the table was proud that he came to the table. 
and I saw that repeatedly in the room. Wait a minute, this was a reversal because we were told that they are, ladies and gentlemen, we are not important. Yet, we, the employees, thought the major D is the most important person in the room. And so did the guests suddenly. And I thought, why? I thought, very simply, because he didn't come to work to work. He came to work to create excellence in what he was doing. And because of that excellence, he established himself as an equal gentleman in the room. So I wrote my SA and named my SA, we are ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen. If we are excellent, what we are doing? If we come to work for excellence and define ourselves by excellence, because like it or not, we spend most of our waking life at work, why not define ourselves there as somebody excellent? So I wrote that SA around him, and of course, when I started Ritz Carlton, I made it the motto of our company. It implies that I respect every employee as a lady and gentleman. It implies at the same time that I expect excellence from each one. It implies that the managers are supposed to treat them as ladies and gentlemen, not as employees. They are human beings, ladies and gentlemen, that were selected in the first place, introduced our organization to our dream, and they should now be treated as ladies and gentlemen. So lady, the, the expression, the motto that still is Ritz-Carlton's motto, many years later, I'm away from Ritz-Carlton over 10 years, uh, that motto still exists and has become kind of world famous. That's, that's incredible. And you talk about excellence. I think in our community, there's a lot of these social enterprises that are getting things started right now. And they have, they're doing it on really small budgets. And so sometimes they're relying more on the social concern in it than they are in the excellence. Can you talk about like what that tension is that you feel like? How do you still be excellent when maybe you don't have the biggest budget? Well, excellence has nothing to do with budget. I can I, and look at if you if I refer back to the matter D, it had nothing to do with budget. That he went to the tab that he knew his menu, that he knew wine, that he. He would have never entered the room without looking perfect. Mind you, that's a market segment we serve. We serve an upper market segment, so he never would have entered the room without looking perfect. You could have shaved in his shoes, so that, that's how they were shining. So he, he projected excellence in everything he did, adopted nothing of it cost money. Being right, knowing your job, starting a job, caring for people. Excellence and caring for every guest, for every employee, all that doesn't cost money. So you apply the excellence, sure. If you look at excellence uh, and, and, and think of Ritz Carlton, you may think of the chandeliers on the marble and so on. But that's just a facade. The excellence were created by fine employees. The image of Ritz Carlton was not the, the chandeliers and the marble and the, and the art. That was just one piece that lent to, that created the right, right surrounding, but the excellence was created by people who cared for, by ladies and gentlemen, our employees who cared for ladies and gentlemen, that ladies and gentlemen whom we respected as ladies and gentlemen, even some of them didn't deserve it. But that was the excellence. And that's the excellence in creating every business, to think about it, to align your employees behind what you're doing, to make sure they're respected and want to do a great job. By the way, that's called leadership. So um, when you go back to the vision you were talking about, I think there's the vision that you have, and then there's the values that go along with that vision and how you play that out well, as a team. I, I, I spoke the other day to graduating class of students, and I, and, I, and I told them, I hope that you have closed your eyes and have a great dream, and think about a beautiful place somewhere in the future. That is not enough, and, that's, and that is leadership, ladies and gentlemen. Managers have a dream for themselves but not for the people connected to it. Leadership starts with self, by, way, by the way. That's why I told them, have a, have a great dream for your life. But that's not enough. The leadership model is having that vision. Be clear about it. See it. Love it for yourself, for your company, for your department, for your family. It doesn't matter. See that place and love it. 
Get committed to it. Just having it is a pipe dream. Get committed to that vision. And then initiate the steps that get you there. That's the model of leadership. See it. But if you see that dream in your business, be sure, be absolutely sure that dream is good for all concerned. You have to agonizely think about, is this good for all? Good for my employees, good for the investors, good for, the, for society, and good for the customer? And once you have the answer, yes, it's good for all concerned, then invest to be committed. Then invest to start taking the steps that get you to that particular vision. And then when the breakdown happens, always, and, and look, I managed, I managed in, 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 a, in a company before 65 hotels, in Ritz-Carlton, 55 hotels. When I left, I opened, by the way, each one did a training to it. I can tell you how people feel. What happens? What are the difference between managers and leaders? Once you have the vision, the commitment, and the initiation of getting there, the focus, the real leader keep on focus on it. They don't find excuses. The managers find the excuses. The manager, if business was not good, you call them and say, well, the weather was bad. We had a storm. There's all, if I had a bigger dining room, if, there's always an excuse, and in their mind, explanation. The leader is still seeking how to get there, even this time he didn't make it. That's the difference between leaders. And, and ladies and gentlemen, we have a leadership crisis in this country, I believe. I, I, I determined that of in, in, the, in the old hotel company, in Ritz Carlton, where I worked, that of the 65 general managers, there were five leaders and 60 managers. The leaders knew they were taking the people to the vision. They knew it was good for every employee. They knew it. The managers just made things happen. Or they were very successful sometimes, but they were only there to make things happen. And they were only, and mainly for their own benefit. So you were, I, I think you are a pioneer in the service industry. You were one of the leading thinkers and, and the service industry today is defined by what you created 20, 30 years ago. Um, yeah. So if you were recreating today a new model for service and what, what would you do? What, what does the future of service look like in your mind? Well, the concentration of what we were doing, it was customer driven, first of all. First of all, we, we went not thinking what I want but actually scientifically analyzing what does the customer really want in my hotel in a given market segment. What does my customer, does what, my, what does my patient, wherever I am, whatever you call them, what do they really want? And then they align your organization behind it. And so at the time we knew what the customer wanted. I would go back now and see what do the customers want today because, because the expectation has changed. For example, the, the thought in your mind of what luxury is has changed. Mm -hmm. Luxury, when we opened the first Ritz Carlton, if I would have analyzed and asked a thousand people, 999 would have talked about the marble, the chandeliers, the fine art, etc. In the mind of the customer, that is not luxury anymore. Luxury in the mind of the, car, of the customer today is do it my way. To adjust individualize and personalize attention to the customer. That means luxury to them. They will still want a good surrounding, but luxury, so I would understand what I want, and then I would build my processes and the thinking of the organization behind what the customer wants. You see, leadership is also aligning the people, and that's a word that's used all the time, alignment. And you ask people what it is, standing in line or whatever. That's not alignment. Alignment is, if everybody in the organization understands where you want to go as an organization and have joined you for that purpose, and understand what the customer wants. So the whole focus of the whole organization is the objective and the expectation of the customers. So that's what I would do. I would again look and I do that all the time. What do the customers want? And we have focus groups, not only focus groups, but in the focus groups, we have word analysis, what the customer really means. What do they really mean? And then we build our process behind what the customer wants. And then we measure if we do, if we give it or not. And if we don't give it, we improve it by eliminating mistakes, 
constantly becoming better. That's an essential thing for every business to constantly improve. And you constantly improve by identifying defects. And if a defect re repeats, find the root cause, eliminate that cause so the defect will never ever happen, happen again. What happened then? You lowered your cost and improved your product. That's how our company, if you're small, and doing, doing that with excellence doesn't cost money. In fact, it saves you money a lot. And it makes the guest cost happier. That's good. So the future of service in your mind really goes back to what is the needs of the customer? How do you serve that well? Right? How do you meet that needs in yeah. clarity? Enough? Individualization. That will be is the future of the customer. Not it, it's what we did until now, we're doing it, we're getting away from it pretty fast. In the last 20 years, we start getting away from it. what we did, we created a product for a certain market segment. Today, we create a product for a market segment, that, but we are prepared to individualize and personalize the, the service to the individual the way they want it. Pretty soon, the guest will go to a Chick-fil-A, <laughs> you go to a Chick-fil-A, and he doesn't only say, I have number one. They will say, I have number one with half a pickle, three-quarter tomato, no salt, and, no, and, and a lot of pepper. Bang. Individualization will happen. If you know it or not, that's what, where the market is going. And if you're not prepared for that individualization in all businesses, you, you're not going to make it because that's what it is. That is, and that's... In the mind of the customer, in the mind of the consumer, is luxury. If I get it my way, and, and to be prepared for doing that, and of course, in everything, is sense of healthy has to fit in. No matter where, where you're going, if, if, if you do anything that is related to food or anything related to that, or hotel and so on, it always is health, has to be healthy. The kind of, we, we call guests beforehand uh, in, in our super luxury hotels, what do you want? And they want different sheets because they're allergic. You see, there's a health issue. They want to be sure there's no mold in the room. They want the air cleaner in the room, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So health thinking is an important thinking if you're related to any business that touches this. Wow. Um, as you think about the culture, so you had this vision for Ritz-Carlton. You sustained it for years. How did you do that? Like, how do you keep that vision right at the forefront of employees' oh, yeah. minds? How do you, like... How do you make sure they're still connected to the original thought and values that you have? Well, uh, well if they're today, I don't know. I'm not... Right, you're not doing it every day. <laughs> I'm not doing it. But the but way, we, it for many years, the way we sustained it is, first of all, we selected the right people. Selection. Number two, orientation. We, we, we didn't... When the new employees started, we didn't just put them to work. That happens all the time. Hear that. Don't do that. Don't put them there and show them the ropes. You're not even in the rope business, but you show them the ropes. <laughs> I mean, it's pathetic sometimes. What, what happens, I, I give you the picture, I've said, I said that before. Bill comes to work, the new waiter, if you will, and he said, work with Joe. He knows the ropes. And then you, Bill goes with, with, with Joe, and Joe tells him, this company is not good. That's his orientation. I mean, it's ridiculous. You, in the first day of work, you tell him who you are. Here's our heart. And in fact, we tell him, don't work here. Don't come to work. Join our dream. And you share the dreams and the thought and the, and the philosophy and the heart and soul of the organization. You have a soul in your organization. You, people want to join this. And so you align the people into that all. So you have selected. You now have them connected. You know, after that, so you teach them the function, and, and after that, you sustain it. What, the way we do that, sustain it, we have 24 non-negotiables. Those four, 24 things must happen in every hotel. And we repeat one of those non-negotiables. You cannot go to work unless you listen to the non-negotiable of the day. Today is number, number 11. If you get the complaint, you own it. It's number 11. Everybody in our company will hear that non-negotiable, number 11. If, if you get a complaint, you own it. If you're the waiter and the guest complains, 
about his toilet, you own it. You said, forgive me, not they, forgive me. I take care of it. In fact, our employees are empowered to done take care. In fact, as a waiter, please forgive me. I feel bad about my toilet. I will not charge you for breakfast today. This way you keep the, the, the important things you do. In, in, if you're a small, big business, there are four things you're doing. If you don't do those four things, there is something wrong. Number one, and in that order, number one, you keep the guest. Number three, four, number two, three, and four cannot interfere with keeping the guest. If you ask the bus boy in our company, if you ask anybody, what is your number one objective? This would say, I'm here to make sure the guest wants to come back. Customer loyalty is the number one thing you do. Number two, you get new ones. Number three, you get as much money for customers as you can. Hey, without losing them. <laughs> without losing them. And number four, you create, you, you work efficiently. Efficiently by limiting mistakes and so on. But number one is keeping the customer. And you keep the customer by, by repeating what was the question. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was back to like, how do you keep that, the vision in front of the people? So how, do you, the, or keep, how do you keep the culture so, consistent? So number 11 is, is keep, keep the guest. If you have a mistake, you are responsible. Number 11, tomorrow is number 12. So each day we repeat one of the non-negotiables for 24 days. Every day, so all year every long. Every day, all year long, every shift. We are 24-hour business. Nobody goes to work without hearing the basic non-negotiable of the day. So you sustain what they learned day one. You sustain it. In 24 days, number 11 is up again. So, so the managers don't do it because they're embarrassed. Well, everybody knows it. So I told, got all my managers together and said, okay, I understand you don't want to do it. You feel silly. Let me ask you, is there anyone in the room who doesn't know what Coca-Cola is? Raise your hand. Nobody raised their hand. Ah, so you all know. So why do you think they still advertise? Because you have to keep it alive. Why would they not be 10 or 20 or 25 things that, are, that you want to keep alive in your business, that you repeat every day, and that you help them to, concentrate, to, to focus on. That uh, if, you, if, and if they do focus on, they're good for them. They're good for all concerned. That's the point. I love that. It's hard to imagine that because you think as a leader sometimes probably we think, man, we said that yesterday. We said it. Why? That's what they do. They should remember. I just said it, didn't they? Right. That's what they did. And, and that's why when I found out it, it was not being done in every hotel, this has to happen too. Because as the leader, you cannot compromise. Because you have identified clearly it's good for all concerned. Since See, if you compromise, you're going against all. How can you do that? You have no moral right to do that anymore. So it, I made it very easy. When I found out in some hotels it was not being done, I had a conversation with all general managers and said, all right, there are sins and there are dead sins. So let me make it very clear. If I find that anybody doesn't do it in the hotel, I will fire you. I couldn't compromise that. I had to make it very clear after saying a few times you should do it and everybody agreed, yes, we should do it, and it still didn't happen. So I had to make it very clear. Next time I found somebody, they're out. Because I cannot allow that somebody hurts the whole structure and consequently, we may, not, we may not have the image that we should have. Look, I can tell you, if, a, if there were, was a job open and 100 people applied, and there was one of the 100 work for its car and they got the job. Why? Because of the image that we all created. That's why I got, I, I unfortunately got the other day, I was, I was in New York and, and and there were all kind of hotel people, there hundreds, they were awarded their big, and I was just a guest, 
And, and, and when I was introduced, they, they applauded me all. And I said, how sad. How sad that they are applauding me because I didn't see the guest who the doorman in Buckhead created a great image with because every single employee created the image for which I was applauded. And I, I, I would have, I nearly went in the corner and started applauding in my mind, thinking of every doorman, of our bellman, everybody. You see, but if somebody doesn't create that image, then everybody gets hurt. Mm -hmm. And to keep it alive, consequently, you have to have systems. And one of the systems was this daily reminder what they have to do. And also, it would always happen. So when you went into to a, to a hotel in Shanghai, you had the same experience and you went into the hotel in Amelia or in Buckhead. It doesn't matter. I love it. So when you're selecting people, you're finding new people to join your team, what is the number one thing, criteria you're looking for in, in, in hiring someone? Well, it's, in selecting, it's, uh -huh. more, it's more scientific than that. We looked, after we had a few hotels, five hotels, six hotels, we looked at each job category and thought, who are the best in that job category? Then we had an outside company study those people and said, what is common? What is the common talent that they have? Hmm. Consequently, we created a profile behind each job category. Dishwasher, busboy, general manager, no matter what. We created a profile, and when we interview, we interview against that profile. If the profile works, we hire. There's certain questions. It has nothing to do with IQ. It is, it's a talent and a certain behavior and a certain background that works. For example, i give you an idea that's kind of, kind of silly. A doorman, that they work all day outside. We found the commonality in our three best doormen was they liked outside activity and gardening. Hmm. They like to be outside. What would you do if you hire them and you wouldn't know that? You wouldn't ask that question. And you would make them put them in the computer room and they hate it, or vice versa. So we knew, that's why our doormen are there for 27 years, 28 years. They like to be outside. They enjoy working outside. In bad weather, hot, cold, they like being outside. Others would say, it's too cold, I'm going to quit and work inside somewhere. So you have a profile. They go deeper, those profiles. It's mm -hmm. just one simple silly. They go deeper. So you have a profile for each job, job category. After we had that, we moved our employee turnover, annual turnover, which in the hotel business, ladies and gentlemen, is 120%. 100, yes, 120% turnover annually in hotel business. Ours, we, we had a proud, just over 50, very proud. We moved it from there to under 20. The industry is still 120. Wow. It's selecting right people. Of course, also making sure that people working with purpose, hmm. not just fulfilling function. I'm going to say this again. I mean, I hope that sticks to somebody. Just hiring people to fulfill function, like the chair on which you're sitting, is immoral. You hire them to be part of something, part of a great dream, part of a great objective. Adam Smith made a study 300 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, 300 years ago. He came to the conclusion 300 years ago that people cannot relate to orders and directions. And what do we do? We hire people and give them orders and directions. People, he found, are only can relate to motive, you believe, and objective, your vision. That they can relate to. And, and, and we, we know that 300 years, and we hire them, and we give them right away orders and directions. Isn't that great? <laughs> It took us 300 years, and we still pumping around with it. I mean, come on. <laughs> okay, we got one more minute, and I know you're just getting going. But in the last minute, if you were to look back when you started Ritz-Carlton and started all these projects you've been a part of, um, and you think about people in the audience that are starting something, what do you wish you would have told yourself at the beginning that you know now? If I would give you a full answer what I wish I should have done better, that would 
take a long time. <laughs> so that would be uh, so. But uh, again, I go I go back to it. We we uh, we we in the beginning. By the by the way, in the I want to tell you that too. In the beginning, it wasn't all beautiful in the beginning. It was some serious moments we had. And I, I left a fabulous job. I was in charge of food and beverage operations for the whole United States for Hyatt. I came here to, because of the dream of starting a new company. The dream was I'm going to make the best hotel company in the world, blah, blah. I had some money. And I came here in the dream, and the first two years were disastrous. They were disastrous. And in fact, it was so bad. Uh, I didn't tell my wife for a while. It was so bad. I went, finally, I have to sit, and uh, Sherry, she's over here. She's, I'm married 38 years, and I'm still in love, just so you know. And, uh, so. I don't only love her, I'm still in love with her. So now I embarrassed her, but it's true. But I went to Sherry at the time and said, Sherry, hey, it's not working. Uh, we, 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 made, we, we made a mistake moving here. And she said, don't argue with God. We prayed heavy. Don't argue with God. Maybe the job doesn't work, but we didn't make a move, mistake moving here. Whoa, I said, I will never ar argue with God again in front of you. That's done. <laughs> So, but, but, she, but no kidding, she, she wrote a prayer and, and together with, with another lady and prayed it every day. And after 19 years, after 19 years, when I, when I had negotiated to leave, I tried for five years to negotiate to leave, but I, we had came to a settlement and uh, I had to now announce to the company, we went on closed circuit worldwide, 24,000 employees and said, I'm leaving. But I said, I want to read a prayer that my wife wrote. And I read it. And I read it. And believe me, nobody believed it was written nearly 19 years ago. No, 17 years ago, because it had written. What I would have done different, I would have gone to my wife and started the first time day praying, not wasted two years there. So <laughs> <laughs> that's what I would do different. <laughs> so <Yeah>. thank you. <laughs> Well, it's, it's an honor to host you here and Thank to you. learn from you today. And all the other questions I asked you that you told me not to ask you, I got those answers over lunch, which is good. I'll tell <laughs> yeah. you guys that was later. Um, you're definitely a pioneer in this Thank industry. You. And I know many people have been impacted. It's always interesting to meet someone that has worked at a Ritz-Carlton because you have impacted their life even when they didn't know you. So um, thank please you. join me thank in thanking you. for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.